There you are now. We're on That's Roman numeral on three, page two, problems of selection of teachers. And Elvin, your first point is requisite understanding of how residents learn, and you use the terms collectively and individually. What do you mean by them? Uh, processes that uh, uh, have to do with uh, uh, residents learning from each other, from their patients, from the staff uh, as, as a whole, uh, namely uh, structured formations, uh, re uh, essentially around resource uh, uh, kind of uh, teacher functioning, namely uh, giving them the real poop, so to speak, uh, so that collectively they more or less get exposed at least to the same, uh, same uh, uh, material. And then through discussion with each other, uh, through uh, essentially experimenting with their patients, uh, namely uh, uh, seeing in their patients what, uh, uh, what they uh, not only uh, see on the basis of their past experience, but on the basis of what their teacher told them, what they've discussed with their peers, and so forth and so on. So you're saying that teachers have need to know that all kinds of situations can be potentially learning situations for the students. Mm-hmm. Hmm? Well, As a matter of fact, the whole, the whole uh, organization uh, uh, should be geared in such a way that it is uh, always a, a learning experience. You know? Formally and informally. Yeah. Well, then in the next one, you have sensitivity to respond to residents' needs at a given time. Yeah. And then you got four subcategories yeah. in that. What are they? Well, uh, let's say resource. Uh, what percentage of uh, patients are organic? Uh, he may have no uh, no way of knowing that. While you, uh, having a vast experience, uh, may say, well, roughly one third of the patients in general uh, uh, psychiatric practice uh, have one burden in life that is a, a big organic burden. And I put it that way because I want to uh, emphasize that uh, this is only one aspect of the patient's problem. He may be arteriosclerotic, for instance, or he may have a potential brain tumor. In other uh, words, you uh, indicate here that the teacher should be a person of experience in his profession as well as in teaching, mm -hmm. and that he may, in uh, teaching his student, be able to direct the student toward the values of this experience which the student not having uh, doesn't know about. Uh, he may pass over something that would be organic, whereas the teacher had had this experience, mm -hmm. he could direct the student's attention to that. So there is a value of for experience. Mm -hmm. In other words, and you pointed them to another value. That the that teacher respect. can teach only that what he knows. Yeah. yeah. And it's not obliged to that the resident discover that the world's round all by himself, that somebody can tell him about some things. And there is mm -hmm. some, some advantage in, at least in having some senior teachers, some that are older. Mm -hmm. Are any disadvantages to having these senior teachers? Yeah. And it's uh, primarily the uh, fantasies and the aura that uh, that residents put around that teacher, and uh, it uh, essentially stands in the way uh, between them uh, and keeps them from using the teacher. Pick the best teacher that you can think of or that you ever knew, an actual one, and describe what he was like, how he went about his business. The best teacher I ever had was I Sendrick. Well, now, tell us about this. We don't need to use his name. Why was he the best teacher that you, you know, what makes you say that? Because every time I went to, <laughs> went to control with him, I came back with an anxiety attack of my own. Uh, namely, uh, that he asked me things I didn't know and pointed out things to me that I didn't see. And did it in such a way that, uh, uh, is, that only eyes can do. Uh, namely, uh, the hard way, you know, you pay through the nose, but you sure as hell learn.
Yeah. Right now, uh, since this is something that Ives is never going to see, would you like to be like Ives yourself? No. Is there a danger to this Couldn't business be. of provoking so much anxiety on the part of residents? Yes. What's the danger? It can't work. They well, get, is that too bad always? Yes, I mean, uh, they, uh, uh, they uh, suffer an anxiety state and, uh, and are not free uh, with their energy to devote to uh, uh, the learning task. Yes, well, then, does it also follow that the program director has to expect that at various times during the course of the residence training, he's not going to be able to count on them to be as efficient? Uh, co-workers oh, in sure. discharging obligations as uh, yes. they might otherwise. The November-December syndrome yeah. that we were speaking about uh, yesterday. Have November, there been times December? when you couldn't oh, work yes, because yes. of your anxiety? Oh, yes. Yeah. Would a teacher who never had any anxieties so that he couldn't work himself be likely to be a good teacher? I don't know. Uh, there are mature people who keep uh, Would this be a mark things of pretty maturity? at a pretty even level. <laughs> Would this be a mark of maturity or a mark of lack of feeling, possibly? Well, I think if it's a mark of lack of feeling, that that's identifiable. Could but teaching ever be so good that learning is inhibited? <laughs> that's a tricky I, one. I think so. Huh? I think so. The teaching be so good that the anxiety titer is so high that nothing gets in? That nothing gets in? Or uh, the uh, brilliance of the teacher can be so excessive that the, that the student can never hope to uh, aspire to it and he just gives up? Or, or, that it, fear in the student. or that it be so well organized that the student gets a false sense of competence? Yeah, it becomes a, as if imitated. Mm -hmm. Now there's the other part of this, the polar opposite of this. And this, I think, has great relevance in a practical sense. With this anxiety, then, being a likely thing to be generated in teaching situations, uh, and since we're now speaking about psychiatric teaching, uh, where does treatment of the student's anxiety in a formal sense, not in the informal, ongoing, everyday sense, but in the formal sense, come in to a three-year residency program, if it comes in, in your judgment? Well, when the, when the resident needs it. Well, yeah, but I mean, uh, you, you're, you're saying then, what, what's, the, what's the test? What's the test that the program director uh, applies? Uh, a resident now, having had the experience that you have, now comes to me as a program director and he says, look, I just finished a supervisory session, uh, and, and I, I am now really appreciative of the anxiety, and since he now lives in this kind of a milieu, can you arrange to get me some treatment for this? What do I, as the program director, do? Say, well, just ride it through, and when it gets too tough, a week later, a month later, a year later, then we'll consider it? Or do I do it now? When do I jump in? When do I stay out? Is there any rule of thumb? Not that I know of, uh, except your own judgment of the situation. As a matter of fact, this year I have uh, two residents where different supervisors at different times have come and say, well, this, this girl is depressed and, and this man is kind of puzzled and uh, confused. And uh, uh, so uh, I uh, ask the chief of service to look at it, I ask the staff visit to look at it, I ask uh, the uh, my assistant to look at it and I say well if uh, if it looks in your opinion like uh, uh, he's having more of a burden than we can help him with uh, uh, let me know you know and I can stall it in this way but isn't it good to stall it yeah at the beginning yeah. in all instances until well, it really just demonstrates itself unequivocally as a need I think it I think until it demonstrates itself on a uh, Equivocally, that that is uh, that is the point, but that that's a point of clinical judgment. Uh, uh, to jump into it, no. All right then. Let's assume that you've reached this point. Is it is it proper for the department in which he is being uh, taught 
to assume the obligation and responsibility for the therapy, or should this be done elsewhere by strangers? We prefer the latter. But suppose you happen to be located in a geographic situation where the latter is not possible. Well, then you have to do it yourself. Do you postpone gauging the student's needs yeah. to that time at which he comes to you and definitely expresses his need in some way or other? Or is there some element of responsibility when you are directing a program to observe what is going on with reference to uh, residents and trusting to your experience, possibly trying to prevent certain situations developing? I think so, yeah. Part of the teaching job. Yeah, you have to take care of your sheep. Yeah. You know, there's an issue related to this that I'd like to ask all of you. And that is, if this is the case, and now we've talked about treatment as the alternative, when, when or if do you ever drop somebody from the program saying, in effect, yeah, uh, psychiatry is not the field for you, that you ought to get into some other area? Or does it always end up with a therapeutic resolution of the situation rather than a recognition of an impasse? And uh, for one reason or other, it's in our clinical judgment and and pedagogical judgment, desirable for you to be an obstetrician, gynecologist, ear, nose, and throat man, and not a psychiatrist. What about that, Frank? We do well, <laughs> as to which resident should have his residency training discontinued, think of an I think it's pretty obvious with a few of them very early. But the ones that you have go along for a certain length of time, I think you should be very careful about dropping from the program, even after your whole staff sits down, discusses this person, and says, well, he has this and he has that, he's quite unsuitable, and he, is, uh, he, he should be dropped. Why? Well, because I think of three residents. As this has gone on, I've been uh, getting their cases up into mine. We dropped them. Every one of them has turned out to be a very good man. Now, I don't know whether they would have been good if we'd we kept hadn't dropped them. them. That's right. This is a problem. That's what we tell. I don't know. But uh, Dr. Gutman, I think, is an excellent man. Dr. Cutler, I think, is a pretty good man. We dropped both of these fellows. For cause? Well, the cause was principally pressure from the staff, largely on uh, grounds of old psychoanalytic view of these gentlemen's performance and what was interfering with their performance. <laughs> what kind of uh, old sickness they had which would render them unsuitable for work in the field of psychiatry. And all three of them, I think, have worked out quite well. On the other hand, uh, I can recall some that we did not drop, who uh, abilities intrigued members of the staff. They would recognize that there were great defects present, but these were things that could be remedied. And they went on and they finished, and these things did not get remedied. And they have had some very disastrous careers, one of them especially. Now, I don't know that our judgment is always uh, too good on this matter. I can think of... Uh, at least an equal number just at this moment to the ones that we discontinued and who did turn out all right. Now, probably that meant we didn't have a good staff. Uh, Elvin, do you have a machine like this up at your place? You do, so that you could pick what uh, you I wanted. I have a girl who's transcribed. Okay, now you're pick what you about, wanted. You're talking about resource and all of this. Uh, the next one is sustenance. Yeah, and that... Uh, applies uh, chiefly to crises that come up, uh, very painful emotional periods in the resident's life when uh, uh, 
uh, one essentially tides them over, uh, support, uh, not only supports them, but uh, looks after them, uh, protects them. Uh, How does that differ from the next one, which you call support? Where does sustenance come in and support go out or vice well, versa? Well, to put it uh, uh, in uh, very operational terms, sustaining means caring for them, indicating to them that they matter to you, that you love them, that, uh, that they belong to you, you know, and you belong to them for whatever they can use you for. Uh, support is more in terms of helping them bear uh, some distress by lending him a hand or a shoulder, uh, but uh, not as primitive an emotional relationship as... Uh, Carrying their cross for a while or helping them. Yeah, too. or uh, giving them a suggestion as to uh, 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 how they could try your way since their way doesn't work. Uh, or, uh, you know, setting up a new experimental situation. Now, uh, is this a catch-as-catch-can, and is this an open situation for the program director as well as the senior and junior instructors, or should there be a division of labor, and uh, or is it whoever sees it takes it on as his own personal responsibility at the time? In other words, do you see any role definition insofar as these particular functions are concerned for the Department of Psychiatry? Well, I have a hunch that uh, most of your people in your department operate uh, basically on the same principles that you operate. Uh, I operate on the open door policy. Uh, if the door is open, uh, you come in and if I can't see you, I'll make an appointment to see you. I'll ask you if it can wait. If it cannot wait, I'll stop everything and we'll take care of it. Now that, uh, uh, and uh, my assistant does very much the same sort of thing. And uh, the chiefs of our services do very much the same sort of thing. It's a so th this is a matter of selection on the part of the resident as to which open door he goes into That's completely. Right. Is there anything of advantage taking ever in having the open door policy that has to be dealt with? Oh, yeah. If there is, how do you deal with it? Tell them that uh, you don't have time to see him and that it isn't uh, uh, an issue that you want to take up this time. I mean, I have a, a very famous man's son who, who uh, he gets lonesome for his daddy who died, and uh, uh, he wants uh, wants to come in and uh, to shoot the breeze with me. And uh, when that becomes obvious, I say, well, I, I have to uh, do this or I have to do that, you know? I know he has a therapist of his own, so that he can spend the next hour talking about me in his therapy hour. <laughs> I cost people a lot of money, I'm sure. But uh, you set the limits. Uh, uh, yeah, it certainly be. Your this next point's gratification. Yeah. Uh, promoting uh, essentially a give and take, an exchange uh, that. Uh, this uh, terrible thing that they got themselves into called psychiatry uh, has uh, has some reward if you stay with it and work hard enough at it and learn something. Huh? That sooner or later, uh, as you understand people better, uh, they will understand themselves better and they will do something about themselves. Uh, it's uh, the sort of thing you do with a neurotic patient, essentially. You, you know? mean the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow, just stay with it? Yeah, sort of uh, uh, through your own efforts that you earn it, you know. Nobody can give it to you. You have to uh, sweat it out yourself. Uh, I think Dana's probably in a position to talk more about that because he deals with uh, people in other dis disciplines who uh, don't always turn to you because uh, they say they have anxiety but engage you in some way that their anxiety uh, is sort of, uh, you might say, uh, uh, 
uh, shared uh, without uh, acknowledged sharing, and they go about their, their, their business maybe in an, another different field. Huh? No, this happens so many times. You yeah. do yeah. psychotherapy, and the recipient is not aware that he has been involved in the psychotherapeutic process at all. An example was a professor who called up a few weeks ago at 6.30 on afternoon. Something is have going to have to be done. Uh, there is uh, a murder or a suicide imminent in one of my graduate students. And so he goes into a long uh, uh, dissertation on what his problems are and is involved with another professor and another professor's wife. And it uh, turns out it's a female graduate student. And then after a while, I ask him uh, what, uh, uh, wh what kind of a threat has been made. Well, he thought, well, no, no, <laughs> no threat has been made. So uh, then we discussed uh, some of the practical implications that were involved. Well, in about 45 minutes, he was all cooled off. He went to the other professor and talked about the situation. Then uh, he talked to the student herself, and within a matter of two or three days, it had all quieted down. Uh, this was a, an example of one of Jerry Kaplan's crisis consultations, but it involved <coughs> a bit of support, a bit of explanation, a bit of information giving, uh, quite a number of items, but the mm -hmm. net result was that the professor, who was so upset talking murder and suicide, it was going to come from somewhere out on the outside, then became a reasonable person again. Mm -hmm. <coughs> And uh, almost the thing that matters the most is, is presence and uh, keeping the issue open. Mm -hmm. And this could not have been done by anyone without awareness of at least some of the psychiatric implications that were involved in this total relationship involving several people. Is it good teaching after you've gone through with the resident personally a crisis consultation in effect to next day, next week, next month, point out that that is in effect what it was that happened so that he then makes it a conscious, purposeful part of his experience for he's going to be involved in crisis consultations from then on out in the rest of his life. Like one of our residents uh, uh, in a stupid way got involved in suicide of one of his patients. And uh, he literally snuck in, you know, and he confessed uh, that he got mad at her and uh, maybe this is why <laughs> why she got so upset and so forth and so on. Uh, so uh, the only thing uh, that I could do was uh, to empathize with him that uh, uh, a man's for suicide is uh, a terrible problem, you know. I told him about my pathologist and my first suicide. And I didn't ask him any details uh, except what he told me. And I said, well, uh, tomorrow when you feel uh, uh, a little better, come and, come and we'll talk more about it. And then I got more details as to what his role was, what he did, not with the uh, uh, idea of so much pinning something on him, but to clarify as to just what his responsibility was and the uh, implications in in that responsibility. Anything of compulsive, obsessive, phobic ideas of his responsibility in this man? Yeah. I mean, that a bearing on his work in general? Oh, yeah. He's a very compulsive man. He's uh, very much afraid that he's not going to get to the top and, uh, you know, all those general fears that uh, our competitive people have. Well, all of this speaks to your next point, which is capacity to inspire, and then you have in parentheses older instructors. Yeah. I think that the only thing that will uh, inspire a resident is uh, uh, an older person who has survived this all you know, and uh, is relatively calm and collected and still loves people and still is able to say that certain things he 
uh, hates about people, that they stink <laughs> in certain ways, that they're really not very much like uh, Freud said, but at the same time that this is all very, very worthwhile, you know? Uh, the, not the old philosopher, so to speak, but uh, a man speaking from experience uh, uh, that uh, this endeavor is uh, a real meeting a real human need, if you wish, and that uh, uh, one can remain respectable and uh, uh, make a fair living and so forth and so on. All those There's are some analogy here to what I used to tell the MIT professors as I was fussing around with. Your job as a professor, until you're about 50 or so, is to do. Uh, accumulate data, build up your, your professional uh, competence, uh, do research and improve your teaching, but your primary job in a university from 50 on is to be. It is the qualitative aspect uh, of your life from now on that's going to be so important in uh, developing the kind of an atmosphere where young people can grow and flourish and try out new ideas and experiment uh, and go higher than they sort, sort of the voice of experience. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and all that is right. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, then the this will mm -hmm. contrast with familiarity, too. Are there other points in this business of C, older instructor, and D, younger instructor, aside from these points that Dana made and that Frank made? Well, I think there's a point of uh, accessibility for uh, uh, exchange of experience with the younger man that uh, isn't as free and easy as uh, with uh, most older men, because not of because of the uh, older man's uh, unwillingness or but uh, because the resident just uh, doesn't feel free to do this, especially if that older man is also in an administrative position. Like uh, Jack being the boss, which he cannot ex uh, escape uh, uh, with all the responsibility on his shoulders, people won't talk to him about the same things they talk to me about. Now, how, how much is this diluted by or reinforced by sort of extracurricular contacts that should be encouraged in the Department of Psychiatry in terms of contacts with the older and the younger instructors. Is this a good thing? Is it something to be encouraged? Is it something to be allowed to go along spontaneously? Is it something to be discouraged? I don't quite get the point. Uh, Non-working contacts contacts with the, the distaff side of your residence. Uh, these boys have problems with their wives who, who are in the dark not having any of these sorts of things and only get it filtered through their resident husbands. Mm -hmm. What's the role and responsibility and obligation of younger instructors, older instructors, formally and informally, vis-a-vis -vis the residents and their families in extracurricular relationships? I have so little experience in that. Have you had? Well, some. Um, you mean something of uh, this kind? I go back to Adolf Meyer. I called to see Mrs. Meyer a year and a half ago in a certain chair in the parlor. I asked her if she remembered Clarence Naiman. Remember Naiman, who had been one of yeah. Meyer's students. Oh, yes, says, I'll never forget him. You see that chair there? <laughs> he sat in it and broke it. You know, we used to have parties every uh, Sunday evening. The resident staff came out. I think you mean something of this kind, among other things. Yeah. yeah. Now, uh, what about these things? How how can they be used in the uh, general uh, group teaching situation? Oh, this is terribly important. I think so, uh, too. We've, we've done this quite purposefully. Yeah. See, in the first place, we're in a small community. And I've made it a point to get to meet the wives in the springtime, we usually have their wives and the children out for some kind of a picnic. We get to have a chance to, to, to deal with them on this kind of a basis. And I think it's been extremely helpful for what it does, it seems to me, is to palliate the intra-family 
situations that are exacerbated by this fellow's working obligation. For example, one of the girls said to me, you know, when he was on medicine, he never used to come home as exhausted as he comes home now. This is, he had just been in his first or second quarter. And now he comes home, and he's just completely beat. And I ask him what he does, and all he does is sit and talk to not more than three or four patients a day. What are you guys doing to him? Sort of an approach. Well, she hadn't the foggiest notion of what was going on, much less the difficulty that he had living with all of the tension that, in effect, was somatized as far as he was. And he just came home and was completely pooped. Now, it's this kind of thing, and then we have encouraged these girls to get together. Now, they live in a place where it conduces to this kind of getting together and sharing. We have an auxiliary. The unofficial yeah. auxiliary. Yeah, yeah, the auxiliary kind yeah, of a business. We well, I was a, a medical student. I saw the inside of two faculty homes, and uh, one of them uh, was where I learned how <laughs> how to light a fire, which I didn't do very well last night. The other one, I only use that. The other one was C. Mac C. Camel's home, and what that work of their world. That what that did to me. <laughs> what that did to me was to say, well, a psychiatrist can be a human being. Here he has books in his house. <laughs> he's a charming fellow. He's a charming fellow in his lecturing, but he's quite, uh, it was quite different in his own home. It is perfectly possible to live the life of a cultured gentleman and still be a psychiatrist in a crude way. That's what I learned uh, from this one little experience to which I was invited and my wife was invited. I think it had a good deal of influence. Two times, though, uh, in the course of a medical career, getting inside a faculty home, that's uh, really going some. Now, in this connection, I have found that the so-called journal clubs really amount to, in effect, group therapy, and it, and it has practically very little to do with the exchange of information right. insofar as the articles are concerned. That's right, they write a paper. And That's right, and it's the business of sitting around, and they have a beer or so together, and we purposely have them hold it. They hold it at different uh, residence homes, and then have the option of inviting any one of the junior or senior staff to attend. And it really provides a forum for this kind of interchange and the dilution of uh, anxiety. You learn something of a style of life, yeah. which is extremely important so far as the inner morale of uh, a young person entering a professional field is concerned. And that has been very deficient. I, uh, my private life and my professional life entirely separate. They should be but kept separate, but they don't have to be kept uh, rigorously separate. In other words, if you have, uh, say at Harvard, with 4,500 people in the faculty, of whom, let us say, uh, uh, 1,500 are, are have relatively important positions, if every faculty person had students in his home, uh, say twice a year. Uh, just think of how, uh, what a tremendous number of contacts that would be. Can we stop? No, no, no. that's it. Pay uh, remarkably mm -hmm. little attention to these off-the-record, casual, informal contacts which have considerably more to do than we realize and possibly almost as much to do with developing motivation as any of the formal contacts. I might say we had an experience here which brought first great anxiety to this whole household of residents. We let them down in this trial. We thought that was part of their their uh, training. We let them hear Donnelly, who was on for nine days. He then spoke of it. Then after we were through with it, we were going to speak it again, and I said, let's drop it because the anxiety tighter around here was so high for a while that we were a little bit afraid. Now, it, <coughs> it eventuated well. It's a good experience. It had the result of unifying the group. We went through something together. There was empathy between the residents and those of us who were on the spot, and they learned a lesson. So I think that that, like these journal clubs that you've taken part in here, they're good things. It depends on the person, though, I think, but even though Alvin never might have these people to his home a little to get acquainted with his style of life. 
that brings us to this next point, this capacity to express valued opinions without stymieing initiative and new ideas. Mm -hmm. what, what do you mean by that, Owen? Well, like uh, last Wednesday, I was talking to uh, the BU group, uh, and uh, one of the men uh, is interested in uh, attention and uh, uh, how it... Uh, plays a role in not only in terms of development, but how it plays a role in terms of uh, a given contact for psychotherapeutic purposes. And uh, he uh, expressed the opinion that he thinks this is a very innate, organically determined quality of a person. And uh, I said, well, uh, that may be true. In my experience, I don't think so. I think this is a developed trait. Attention. Yeah. yeah. The capacity to give another human being uh, your attention or the capacity of uh, one human being to gain another person's attention. Now, uh, he may be entirely right. Uh, I may be entirely wrong or vice versa, but uh, uh, I uh, thought on the basis of my experience that I would give an opinion but, but keep it as an opinion. Supporting your point of view, I, I think it was William James, but it may not have been. That is, to devote attention to something, you have to be interested. To be interested, you have to take an interest, following which you become interested, and then one uh, is able then to, to pay attention uh, without having too many diverse... Uh, or, uh, Charlie? Anyway. Or what we run into with our residents all the time is... Uh, uh, the kind of guy that comes to our place is the kind of guy like you and I are, you know? He'll do what he thinks should be done first. And you see him doing this. And he tries to keep it from you uh, when he sort of senses that uh, you're not quite uh, with it 100%. And may come a point where I say, well, I don't think this will work. But uh, since I know you, and uh, I'm, I uh, remember how I was. I suppose you have to uh, uh, try until you have convinced yourself from your own experience that this is not the way to do it. But I want you to make sure that uh, I think it should be done this way. Now, up to now, we've been talking about what's good for the residents. Wouldn't you agree that this is really a two-way street and this is just as good and just as stimulating and just as encouraging and just as rewarding for the teachers in the program and keeps their motivation, interest, and everything else at a high critical point. Hmm? The teacher uh, must be a student continually, yeah. right up until the last day he that, That's the next thousand. item, F. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's what I was leading into this. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think I'd want to work with... Uh, residents now that I've had the chance to work with people uh, like the group I'm working with that I can't learn from. And uh, this uh, often comes up, you know, uh, uh, the initiative in our place is our problem. <laughs> Everybody's got an idea and he wants to, <laughs> wants to put it into effect now, you know. And uh, this, uh, you know, what kind of havoc that can uh, uh, create in a uh, in a place, uh, and to go along with it up to, uh, as, as, but to try to keep it a learning situation is, is uh, well, it's not so easy. Do you ever try to turn the informal to a, into a more formal type of teaching, oh, just for a few moments, in the interest of exactness, precision, definition of ideas, considering such uh, old worn-out items possibly as attention and memory and perception and judgment yeah. and retention and things of this kind so that they actually get um, little pegs or hooks in which mm -hmm. to hang information and at the same time to see what the dynamics are. You see... Uh, I think there, uh, that's uh, where we run into this uh, problem of how a teacher has developed himself. Uh, the four of us in this room probably developed uh, first uh, 
around uh, the idea of uh, uh, learning to describe what we saw and uh, sort of learning a, a language of this, uh, this field. And then we uh, went through what uh, you know, was uh, somebody's version of psychobiology. Mine was Campbell's version of, uh, of Meyer with his prejudices, and uh, which he was very free with, and uh, so forth and so on. And then, then came uh, other people like uh, Ives and Helena and uh, uh, my analyst and so forth and so on. Uh, really, uh, one can say that one is one specifically. One is really the product of his own development. And uh, how one has learned may not be exactly how the resident will learn. But one, one certainly can use this as a frame of reference and uh, referring to these very specific items, like the residence as well, flight of ideas. Yes. What do you mean? What does it look like? What did you see? You know? Mm -hmm. uh, In other words, um, we did get something of value from these teachers of the older school, all white, mm -hmm. and uh, noise. Stracker, and they they could give you some very precise ideas about some of the basic contents, and yet uh, if you uh, this does seem to be cut and dried. However, it need not be so. If you can pursue the subjects as they start them out, this I, I think probably in our teaching now we don't include enough of this. There isn't quite enough precision in uh, some of the teaching. It is why I'm convinced that every good training department ought to have a Dave Boyd who does this magnificently. Mm -hmm. Magnificently, really. And, and his contribution in the way of, of erecting these pegs. He's so damn them. obsessive That's about That's the point. It, That's the point, though. It's when... You it, remember that. <laughs> At this point, it comes in advantageously in the total situation. For everybody else is such a freewheeling guy around our place that they're running off in all directions on the back of Stephen Laycock's horse until he comes in and says, well, look, it's this, 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 subheading one, two, three. And then immediately you almost see the crystallization of these ideas in, in some concrete fashion. This is a distinct advantage, I think. Well, what are we doing? Well, I mean, your resident that got concerned about the suicide <laughs> probably can do the same thing yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think I think it's important that um, the teacher yeah. have uh, some have his feet on the ground and that. Uh, these various items we spoke of have some definite meaning to him and that it will make it seem worthwhile to the student to take these things on, especially if he can give good examples of what he means drawn from his own experience and centered about the cases of patients. Or better still, if he can take these things from what the student presents and get the student to actually work out the definition. I think they get very sloppy about such things as what Put a step memory the and recall actually uh, consist in and uh, how you trace back and how you get a great deal of valuable clinical information, how they will be much less likely to miss that organic case if they look at these purely psychological evidences that come before them and the uh, several channels of inquiry that can open up for them. I think of two kinds of individuals that may be the product of a residency training program. The one who is, uh, one side of the spectrum, who is inclined to over-organize his data and is very quick to interpret what uh, should be done in a given situation, and you always have to 
push him back from uh, acting on the basis of insufficient evidence, really. And then over at the other end of the spectrum is a fellow who always takes in new ideas, who is uh, apparently quite diffused, who, who uh, wants to get data until it runs out of his ears before he comes to any kind of a conclusion. Somewhere along the line there, say roughly one-third of the way from this latter fellow over to the other, you've got what I think of as the ideal clinician, the one who never over-interprets, he never jumps to conclusions, he doesn't have to work to prove that his first idea was a good one, who can change his mind when new data uh, requires it, who, to use a business school phrase, who makes decision on the basis of constantly changing and insufficient facts. Somewhere along the, in the way, about one-third of the way from the diffuse fellow over to the rigid, over-determined one is the ideal product that we're trying well, to one, one that won't be stopped and stumped yeah. when he runs into a patient with an aphasia. Gentlemen, I wonder if we can move along so we cover well, this. Well, we're from moving along, but one of the things I'd like to ask, we've been now talking about the problem of selections of teachers, and as you people have been defining them for this past hour, he turns out to have to have the characteristics and capacities of a Renaissance man, able to do all kinds of things in all directions. Uh, well, just a little. Bit. Yeah. Uh, he has what to be what the resident needs him for. That's right. Now. <laughs> What happens when he isn't? Well, you may have to improve your teacher, Which too. is usual. A part of your job is building a crop of teachers. Right. And a part of our job here in this report is to help the poor teachers become better teachers by having some sort of a philosophical model to, uh, from which they can uh, pre-associate. The, the analogy for the program director is not entirely correct, but uh, the part object uh, analogy. You use Dave for what Dave can do. You use Greenblatt for what Greenblatt can do. <laughs> you use Ives for what Ives can do. And uh, Sounds like Napoleon and his marshal. <laughs> almost, almost. Yeah. But I'm also you use yourself for what you can do, you know. You can't do everything. Yeah. The uh, face of the ideal Hollywood star that has Greta Garbo's eyebrows and somebody else's nose and somebody else's mouth and it looks oh like Oh Lord, they don't bother those <laughs> eyebrows and the nose, they're easily modified. And I like Robert Frost's little poem about seeing this little mite on a clean piece of white paper and then his first impulse is to quash it and so on and, and he ruminates a while and finally decides that any show of mind on paper should be respected. So <laughs> 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 let it go. Um, and certainly, um, good teaching involves a tremendous number of different points of view. Now, I think of, uh, you mentioned Ives Hendrix, and so I'll be brutally frank about it. I think he's a very bad example uh, in one sense as a role model and an extremely good example mind. as a penetrating, intellectually acute individual. And I think it's extremely good for people to come in contact with that yeah. kind because of a teacher. Because you feel sorry for him, mm -hmm. too. You don't have the feeling, see, that, that good teachers necessarily have to be uh, perfect individuals. Uh, that, that, that they have problems of their own, too. Well, now, this has all naturally led into Roman numeral four, which is teacher training. Would you mm -hmm. say something about your outline? Uh, well, I think we touched on it in considerable measure, namely uh, in terms of uh, uh, using the teacher for uh, what he is uh, skilled for. Uh, and uh, if one... Uh, uh, just for purposes of discussion, sticks around uh, uh, the uh, major tools in our field. One can uh, cla classify teachers who have more skill with one uh, tool as compared to another. The, like uh, uh, the descriptive psychiatrist, uh, uh, we can uh, use somebody at our place for that. Like uh, the uh, analytically uh, oriented, we can use somebody in our place uh, uh, like that. The medical and surgical aspect, we can use somebody uh, in our place for that, including our neurologist uh, uh, 
but probably what's left uh, uh, to uh, my uh, generation of uh, uh, people is uh, more the interaction studies, uh, uh, the whole implication of uh, <coughs> negotiating uh, with the patient as a person. Uh, and uh, Well, then uh, you're saying insofar as the approach, that what the you would recommend not proscribing anything. Didactic lectures, conferences, supervision, card, no, contact. That far. In other words, anything that's available is potentially grist for the mill if it's a congenial modality for the individual who happens to use it. Is yeah. this what you're saying? Yeah. Can we? We have people who are excellent resource people and who tell it very well in a lecture. Can we and the lectures are remembered somewhere along the line, and I'm not sure in which area, but that one of the goals of a residency program, as it is of any graduate school, is to open up the person's mind to free expression, to give him a chance for any spark of creativity that he may possess, that we not uh, burden him down with um, with blinders <laughs> that are peculiar to his profession. The theological student becomes a prisoner very soon after he hits the place. The law student becomes a different kind of a prisoner. The medical student becomes another. The psychiatric resident becomes another. All of us ought to be on guard to, to help our own students avoid developing the blinders that are to the peculiar hazards of their own profession. Yeah, I think that's a very important uh, yeah. uh, feature of uh, uh, teaching the uh, not only exposure to multiple teachers, but uh, the careful guarding, if you uh, want to put it that way, that uh, the student doesn't go all out for any one teacher mm -hmm. uh, so that he doesn't e emerge uh, uh, like the typical resident who comes from a one-man show, and we see these at the board. All right, well, now this brings up the question of the uh, curriculum, then, the content of the curriculum. Uh, there have been all kinds of suggestions here which would indicate that it can either be structured in some detail or relatively unstructured. Have you any particular feeling about this? Mm-hmm. What's your feeling? See, it all has to do with content. The, ma uh, the main item of, uh, of uh, uh, curriculum is one, the patient as he is. Two, the tools, how to get to know well, him. Now let's stop on a patient. Uh, in most situations, this is patients in the plural. Is there an optimal number? of patients that, I'd say, should be carried. Do you want to get into this kind of business? Is this uh, relevant, Frank? I don't know. We, we, we uh, certainly should we not get into these details? I'm afraid that, uh, that what we're going to do is have an excellent dissertation on the teacher, which ought to be in our report as an appendix, from what I see, from what I hear developing. But uh, because to try to get the essence of this and put it in won't do. But it ought to go in because this is invaluable. And some of this will help you with content yeah. program. It will help with that, but there's another thing while we're at it. So, next question, <coughs> The next question has to do with Roman numeral four on page two that we've been talking about, teacher training. Um, and I guess you had gotten down to... Uh, teacher exchange of experience of teaching formations, number C. We hadn't talked about that. Mm -hmm. Workshop, discussion group, study of experiencing as well as learning processes. I'd certainly like to know how you uh, have developed this in your organizations. Uh, in our own shop, uh, we have uh, a supervision workshop where uh, supervisors get together and uh, go over a case and uh, try to uh, 
to formulate uh, basic principles of uh, supervision. That's the essence uh, uh, of it. Then from time to time we have what we call discussion groups where we get our 50 supervisors together and try to iron out some of the more administrative and some of the more uh, overall uh, aspects of uh, uh, supervision. Usually uh, uh, it uh, consists essentially of uh, organizational matters. Uh, uh, now the last, uh, we've been very uh, stymied on that, uh, but we have a plan for next year where uh, our hospital is essentially divided into services. Uh, so that we have sort of uh, five small units uh, in a big unit, and we're clustering our residents and our supervisors around the service so that it's a smaller body, and they can uh, uh, hopefully get together um, much more regularly and study uh, uh, some of these aspects of teaching. Now, just how they're going to structure it, I... Uh, I don't know. We have had a teacher, uh, career teacher, who has gone different places and studied different uh, uh, ways of teaching. Uh, uh, primarily, this was medical students. Now he's, of course, teaching residents. Who is this? Webster. And uh, uh, just how that's going to work out, I don't know. I have the impression that most teachers in psychiatry get to be teachers in psychiatry as an expression of their own motivation, the propitious circumstances that put them in that spot, and by fiat on the part of the person running things. I'm afraid you're right. Uh, well, what's your feeling about this? I think it's true. You don't think it can be corrected? Should it be? I don't think it can be. No, I think people want to teach. There's certain status attached to it. hope they're good. I think the teacher is a little bit like an actor in some ways, some more than others. And that um, I feel there's something of uh, power in teaching and the effect that you have on other people's <coughs> minds or that you have something to offer them which uh, attest to your guiding, to your influencing. I don't think that this can be left out of teaching, now the teaching be at all successful. All of us think of what somebody has done to influence us, and we idealize that and romanticize it, and then we think that he was a great fellow. And then we see him in real life, you know, a little bit later, and he's so surprised. And out of this springs yes. our technique, too. Mm -hmm. yeah. well, it's something that's ours, it's our method of doing. This is what led Joseph Jefferson to say that he could act the Shakespearean part even if he came in onto the stage walking on his hands. I don't know. Uh, with me, it has been sort of a way of sublimating and perpetuating my adolescence. Uh, really, uh, this was the best part of my life, really. Uh, being with other people and learning with and from and uh, this is uh, a gratification. Give and take. It's a terrific gratification, and <laughs> as like a collecting of books or something like yeah, that. Yeah, very much. Mm -hmm. You have no feeling of any effect on others. That means that you are important in influencing them. Oh, I, th I think so, but uh, this uh, is not the major uh, subjective uh, evaluation of the experience from my standpoint. Of course, you could be wrong about your subjective evaluation. I, I could be, but uh, it could be a lot of money. It could be a therapeutic <laughs> experience for yourself. Keep at it, Joe, so we can get Yeah, but you're time. now saying, then, that uh, these idiosyncratic factors that finally result in this product are what we have up to now recognized to be the operative ones. I raise the question, are they the desirable ones, and should we now, in surveying the whole problem of 
graduate psychiatric education be satisfied with this, or is there anything that could or should be done to change it? Do you see anything that you could substitute for these things which would improve the teaching product? Not at all. This is what concerns me. Not at all. I mean, I, I think these are the, the sine qua nons of, of teaching. I think you have to have somebody that's really motivated. When a man says, I like to teach, of course, that covers a lot of territory. What yeah. do you mean by yeah. like? Why he likes? Yeah. But there is enters into his liking. You see, status-wise, it's strictly second fiddle all the way through. Second fiddle? Second sure fiddle? Does. Wait a minute. Uh, now oh. it doesn't. Most oh. Second universities. fiddle? That's yes, right. most That's of the universities right. research men. Oh, is that oh, what you oh mean? well. A research and administrator. Oh, I They're see. number one. Yeah. yeah. Oh, And well. this has lost its, uh, its You place. mean the clinical teacher you're speaking yeah. of? The clinical teacher or the academic teacher? He's or? lost his place, unfortunately. I see, there may be two professors, but one's head of the department. And the other one, if he's a research professor, he lives in a different world, too. Yes, I think that power and administration go together in appealing to people. And I think research, we all have a hope that maybe we could contribute something that was really far in advance of the field, and actually teaching has to be behind the front lines because we teach behind what the advance has been. But doesn't all of this exalted status of research in psychiatry <coughs> at the present time indicate a pervasive dissatisfaction with what we say we know about psychiatric processes and techniques? It's one thing, but it's the same in all branches, and we notice it down, as you did at the NIMH, that research is the magic word in the man who's a research man. It covers a multitude of sins to where I think it's interfering in some of the colleges. Yeah, but, but my, my, I don't want to lose my point. My point is this, that to be sure, research is desirable and necessary, but I, I have the feeling that on the American scene in psychiatry now, there are two kinds of feelings that prevail. One that says, in effect, we know nothing about psychiatric problems. It may, they may be genetic, they may be biochemical, they may be enzymatic, they may be such and such. And consequently, we have to put most of our eggs in a research basket with the hope, ultimately, of coming up with the answer. There's another group that says, no, no matter what it is that these people come up with, and it might be facilitatory or whatnot, but we really know now a significant amount about how people behave and relate to each other, so that all of these contributions that research can make can only be considered supplemental. Now, is this a, an unfair judgment of the American scene at the present time? Well, I don't know what... Uh what I see in my own uh, daily week is, uh, let's say, uh, 25 years ago when I was a uh, resident, uh, the Royal Road to uh, the top of the field uh, was uh, knowing your business, knowing your people, uh, patients, and uh, that sort of thing. Today, the Royal Road is research. And our young people... Uh, in their second year, third year, already want to go into research because that's that's the way to uh, to. Uh now you're not segmenting research. Do you mean purposely not to? Does it mean any kind of research, or are you now talking about laboratory research, behavioral that's models and analogs and lower animals, chemical things? What? That's that's the only kind of research that has any respectability. Clinical research has absolutely none. You can't even get a grant for a clinical research project. The hard-nosed boys are in the majority on the advisory committees now in all but a few instances. So you're saying that if someone comes in interested in the study of hibernation habits and marmosets, they're likely to get it, whereas if someone comes in and is interested in, in, in 
some other clinical kind of thing, he's likely not to get it? That's right. So therefore you're saying clinical research is now de class A. And in, in other words, and he needs to know another new uh, profession, grantsmanship. Yeah. He needs Let's to know how...